yeah, so I'm worried. Um, and one of the reasons I'm worried, actually, I, I was asked, I was asked to give a talk at the, the COP Climate Summit in Glasgow just by video, one minute. And they just, it was a little project. And they said, if you, if, if you could say anything to the world leaders there, what would you say? And I said, just very simply, that given what I know, and given to a lot of people I've spoken to, it's possible that we're the only civilization in the Milky Way galaxy at the moment. Right? It's, it's worth considering that might be the case. And there are reasons we can go into about why that may be the case, but it's possible. So if it's true, imagine it's true, I think that if we're talking about the meaning, meaning of it all, was it mean to, to be a human in this universe? Well, meaning is a property of intelligence, I think. So clearly the universe means something to us. So meaning exists here. But if there's no other intelligence out there in our galaxy and we destroy ourselves, then we might eliminate meaning in a galaxy of 400 billion stars forever. That's what we might do. So consider that, <laughs> world leaders. That's... That you, you have potentially a galactic size responsibility to maintain meaning in a galaxy. And it, so that's, I, that's why it bothers me, because I think that's true. So I think, I think what we do here will have ramifications in that sense, way beyond the, the shores of our own planet. Because, you know, you look at, to me, a lifeless world, a lifeless galaxy, is a meaningless galaxy. It was when I was working at the Large Hadron Collider, actually. So I, I was just a, a postdoc working at CERN. And there was a lot of interest, clearly, in the LHC and CERN at the time. The Higgs particle. And uh, so um, there were a series of interviews done. I think film crews came and, and Radio 4 did a, a season on it. And, and it just, uh, for some reason, that they liked the way that I talked about the physics. So it was, it's one of those things I think, um, I always joke that if you're one of those people that really wants to be on television, you shouldn't be on television. It's like going into politics, I suppose. Um, and uh, so it was, it was an accident. The first show that I made was for BBC Four, and it was on the LHC. And I can't even remember what it was called, actually. It was, and Cosmos was a tremendously, and still is, a tremendous influence on me and my, my thinking. Because uh, Carl Sagan really felt, and he was absolutely right in my view, that science is more than just science. It is part of culture, it's part of our civilization. It's a fundamental, um, one of the fundamental pillars on which our civilization rests. And he was not afraid in Cosmos to place it in its proper cultural context. You know, the music and art and history, it's all there. So Cosmos is a, is a history of civilization. It's not just a science documentary. And it's also a polemic, which was, I think, to me at the time, extremely unusual. If, if you can contrast that with The Sky at Night, for example, The Sky at Night is about astronomy. And it's brilliant, it's just about astronomy. But the 13th episode of Cosmos is about the danger and folly of nuclear war. It's, it's a polemic. Um, and I have got increasingly interested actually in, a, in some, of the, some of the great scientists who were working at the time, who actually who came out of the Manhattan Project and Sagan obviously was very, think, you know, he'd grown up with the Cuban Missile Crisis and so on. So there was a great concern at that point that we would destroy ourselves. And if you look back actually a bit earlier, um, Oppenheimer, I've got increasingly interested in Oppenheimer. He did the BBC Wreath Lectures, by the way, in 1953. And you can listen to one of them because the BBC taped over the other ones. So there's only one of them left, but it's on the website, but the transcripts are there. And uh, he, and many of those scientists felt that they were very fortunate to be alive in the 50s. And Richard Feynman is another one, one of my great heroes, who wrote widely in the 50s about the fact that he felt that the power that 
science had delivered to our civilization was greater than the wisdom of our civilization. And, um, and, and all of them, Sagan, go back to Oppenheimer, Feynman, they were all thinking, is there something in the way that nature forces us to think and in the things that we've discovered about our place in the universe and how we came to be where we are? Is there something in there that can be transferred to wider society? Not just the facts, but the, the way of thinking. And Sagan was beautifully eloquent on that. There's a very famous pale blue dot, which he wrote, if you've seen the reflections on the image of Earth taken from beyond the orbit of Neptune, just a single pixel. And if you've never read that, it's an extremely powerful piece of writing um, where he says things like, um, you know, in its cosmic context, he says, I, I can't remember exactly, but it's something like, think of the rivers of blood that have been spilt by people who, you know, in, in their glory and their wonderful visions are fought for the momentary possession of a fraction of a dot. And it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of writing. And, and so, but um, going back to Oppenheimer and Feynman, they, um, the, and it's the same with Sagan, the, the, what they came to, I think, the idea that they came to, is that, that there are two mutually, apparently contradictory ideas that arise when you think about our place in the universe. One is that we have been, over just the last four or 500 years, demoted from the center. So we've gone from the center of the universe to, to a tight one planet around, around one star in 400 billion in one galaxy amongst two trillion in a small patch of the observable universe, which may be one universe amongst an infinite multiverse of bubble universes. Right? So we've been demoted. But at the same time, and Sagan did this in Cosmos, made it so clear, we don't know of anywhere else where this happens. So it's a reasonable assumption. Why don't we proceed by assuming that this is the only place where, as Sagan memorably said in Cosmos, atoms have come together that can think and feel and explore the universe. He said that, you know, we are, what are we? We're collections of atoms that can understand atoms. And that you might have to go a long way, perhaps millions of light years or more before you find that. And that's what Sagan did. So he didn't just talk about astronomy in Cosmos. He used it to it try to teach us or inform us of our fragility and value. And he used it as a political, it's a political film or a political series, which I found very attractive. I was a particle physicist. So, so I, was, I was actually running a, an upgrade project. So the thing with particle colliders is you're upgrading them before you turn them on, right? So I was running an upgrade project. So that's what I was doing. I, I was in charge of a team and we were trying to put little detectors very close to the beams at LAC. And that, that, was, that was what I was interested in. So, so I, but I did have also, I was involved in, um, we, we, we had some problems politically at the time with funding cuts in science. So I, I had got involved in making the case that cutting research is uh, not ideal. In a, in a competitive world. I got distracted away from astronomy and physics at 18, so I didn't even go to university. I didn't, you know, I went off and joined bands and came back at 23. Yeah, I mean, music came a bit later, actually. I was always into astronomy. And music, it wasn't, I, I didn't learn an instrument. I, I just, um, it, uh, what it was was I started going to gigs. Uh, I mean, initially, um, I have a younger sister, and I remember really vividly, my mum and dad said she wanted to go see Duran Duran. And I, when was it? It was 1983 or something. So she was probably 12 or something like that, or 13. And uh, so they said, you have to go with her. You know, you have to take your, take your sister. And I was like, oh, I don't want to do that. I want to, I don't know, look through the telescope or something. So, so I went to the, the Duran Duran gig and I loved it. I thought, that's incredible. That's, I'd like to do that. So, so about the age of 13 or 14, I decided I would try and learn an instrument or something um, and formed a band. And then bizarrely, and it, with a stroke of luck, 
uh, the keyboard player from Thin Lizzy, the rock band, mo- moved in quite close to where I lived in Oldham. And my dad met him in the pub and gave him a demo tape. And he was in, you know, this demo tape that a 15 year old had made or a 16 year old. But when I was 18, he remembered that there was a keyboard player up the road and he was forming a new band because Lizzie had split off. And, and so he invited me down for an audition. So I ended up joining this band, which was an offshoot of Thin Lizzy. So uh, rather than go to university. Yeah, science fiction played a big role in my, um, my stimulating my interest. And I didn't really make much of a distinction when I was sort of eight, nine, ten years old. You know, it was about space. So it doesn't matter whether it was the sky at night or Star Wars to me. It was, it was interesting because of the, as, as Kubrick said when he was writing 2001, it's about the limitless potential of humanity uh, when, when we take our first step out to the stars. And that's what I felt about. So I, I fortunately, I think, can mix them up. So, so when, when I got to uh, senior school and started doing physics, phys- physics to me had the, the, the atmosphere around physics lessons was, the, was space exploration and Star Wars. And I've made that connection that, that that is the subject that takes you to the stars. So I think, I think it's extremely important, actually. And I'm not one of those people who thinks that science fiction has to be, has to be absolutely right. You know, I think it clearly is fiction. Um, the, the only film that I've been involved in heavily was a film called Sunshine, actually, that has to do with uh, Danny Boyle. And uh, Alex Garland wrote it. And they sent me the script. Uh, it was actually shortly after that Horizon, actually. I think they saw me on that, that old Horizon and sent me this script and it starts saying our son is dying and we're going to fix it so it was like you know my first reaction to them was well they're both wrong and they said well ignoring that do you want to work on the film so I did work on a film where our son was dying very rapidly not in five billion years but now and we sent a space mission to fix the star which is you know nonsense actually (laughs) but I still think it's a great film (laughs) Horizon was really a training ground. It was used as a training ground as well as films in their own right. And that's incredibly valuable, actually. And a lot of the, by the way, a lot of the directors and camera people who I worked with in those early years on Horizon are now still working on the big documentaries, which are much bigger, you know, more expensive productions, multinational productions. But, um, but so that, that was a training ground. And, and they said, um, you know, what do you want to do? It, it, is there something you're interested in? We'll make a little horizon on it and see how it goes. And Gravity was then and still is actually now one of my great interests. I mean, it's my research now, such as it is, my small amounts of research I still have time to do are on black holes and general relativity. And so I just said, let's let's make one on gravity because gravity is the... Um, I mean, we, we may talk about that later, I don't want to jump ahead, but it's the uh, um, black holes in particular are like Rosetta Stones. They're, 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 they're allowing us to see a much deeper structure of nature, glimpse a structure of nature. Einstein had this beautiful phrase, which is if you pay attention to nature, and it doesn't have to be a collapsed star, it can be a blade of grass, anything. But if you pay attention, then, and if you're lucky and you're, you're persistent, then you can catch a glimpse of something deeply hidden. Which is a beautiful phrase, something deeply hidden, which is the, the deep structure of nature, the deep structure of reality. And it turns out that gravity is a very unusual force. It's a very strange force. And black holes force a reassessment of, of what really what space and time are going back to the Doctor Who clip we're beginning to suspect now that space and time aren't fundamental that they grow out of a deeper theory yeah the the great chat it goes back to Stephen Hawking um, in the 1974 he published a paper which in his language he said black holes ain't so black right they radiate they have a temperature and actually if you go across the road just down the road to Westminster Abbey then you look on the floor of the abbey, then chiselled in stone on the floor of the abbey is his equation, the temperature of a black hole. 
Now, why? Right? Because it was it was a calculation that relied on quantum theory and general relativity. So it's, it's, it's what happens if you put an event horizon, which is a basically nothing, except it delineates a region of space from which if you go in, you can't get out. So it's not, but you can fall through it. So we could fall through the event horizon of a black hole, a big black hole, like the one in the center of our galaxy. We could fall through now in this theater and we wouldn't notice. So you'd fall through. Um, you'd notice eventually because time ends in the middle. But, but we'd have a, in a big black hole, we'd have over a day sort of floating around in there, wouldn't notice, and then time would end, right? Um, but Stephen's great contribution in that initial paper was to show that if you put such a dividing line in the vacuum of space, then it disrupts things in a fundamental way and ultimately the black holes radiate and, and ultimately evaporate away. And ever since, that line of research has been getting more and more challenging, more and more interesting. And it's led in the last few years, which is what my a PhD student that I have, the one remaining PhD student is working on, it's led us to believe that space and time themselves are not fundamental. And there's, there's another description, by the way, of this world that so this is really cutting edge stuff, but it, that we, we, there's an equivalent description of our experience in this theatre uh, contained on a boundary surrounding the theatre. It's called the holographic principle. So there are two ways, it seems, of describing our reality. One is as a reality with gravity in it, and the three dimensions of space and time. And the other one is a pure quantum theory on a boundary. And that's called the holographic principle because that's what a hologram is. So there's a sense in which we're all holograms, right? Really strange, but it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's what it, it, it's the study of black holes and then just doing some, some mathematics, which Stephen did, pioneered in the seventies, which has ultimately led to the, something deeply hidden. What's really interesting is that the, the, the very strange and arcane kind of mathematics that are being used um, it turns out it's the same mathematics that we use when we're programming quantum computers. And quantum computers are real things that we have in laboratories. And so it's, it's the best argument, by the way, for funding Blue Skies research that you will ever get. You know, when politicians always say, you know, why should we fund this stuff? What are you people doing thinking about black holes? You should think about something else that matters. Actually, it turns out that there's been an intimate crossover between solving problems of error correction in the memory of quantum computers, which is fundamentally important, and, and the study of black holes. So that doesn't mean we live in a simulation, by the way. I think that would be pushing it a bit far, but it's, uh, but it's very, very interesting. Every time you make a, theory, uh, a program about Newton or gravity and, and, and the history of that science, uh, we always talk about Galileo, and Galileo said that the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. It's a very famous quote. So in the, in the 20th century, I think, all, well, all the way through from Galileo, actually, through 20th century, if you'd have said to people, what, what, is, is, what is God, right? You would have said, God is a mathematician. Whatever God is, God is a mathematician. And now, in the 21st century, partly motivated by the study of black holes, people are saying, well, God looks more like a programmer because it's information that seems to lie at the, the heart, the, the base of reality. So we, we, we're beginning to wander into the realm of information theory, which, which some of the great, John Wheeler, one of my great heroes, who was uh, actually Kip Thorne, was a, you know, who works on Interstellar, we heard the music for Interstellar. He was a student of, of um, Wheeler. And Wheeler had this idea, it from bit, from years and you know, decades ago, where it is this, and bit, obviously bits, information. And actually, that's the, the, the modern view of space and time, is that it comes from bits. Yeah, and it's hard. I mean, we tried to put some of this in the, the last series that I did, uh, The Universe, we, the, there is a, an episode on black holes. Um, every time I've tried to really dig into this remarkable research that's been done in the last three or four years, really, uh, well, you know, beginning with Stephen's papers, really, but then going through 
Um, the, it, it sort of fails because it's very, it's very abstract. And when research has just been done, then physicists have a tendency to use this phrase when they're explaining it. They say, in some sense. And in some sense means the hands are being waved around in the air because nobody really understands what the words are and what the picture of reality is that this research is, is suggesting. And so when you try to do that in a television program, when you try to put research in there that's been done last year or the year before, really you're finding your way to an explanation. There's no real agreed or easy way of explaining these subjects. The other problem with um, black holes is that you've got very little to point a camera at because it's very, very hard to visualise. Um, and, and that's why I think if you make a series on planets, then they're really successful. You know what to do. It's simple. If you want to talk about a volcano on the moon, on Io, on Jupiter's moon Io, you go to a volcano. And so you can point the camera at something. Whereas if you want to make a, a program about black holes, you've got nothing to point the camera at at all. We have a, you know, there's a structure which changes as well, as, as you'll know, if you, it, when you go out filming a documentary, um, you learn things. And also, you, it's quite an intense process. So you're with the director and the camera people for, for a month or so, and that's all you do. So your understanding of the subject and the ideas that you have change when you're out on location. So, so we don't, we, we go out with a script, but we, the understanding is that it will change quite radically because we might think of something interesting when we're, you know, below the ocean or on a mountain or something like that. What, what, we, what you have is a, is a scientific story that you want to tell. Um, for example, in the universe, the, the last series that we made, which was a very difficult series to make, by the way, because we filmed it during the pandemic. And so people often say to me, Why, how do you choose the locations? And with that, it was wherever it would let us in. So anywhere we can go. So a lot of it was in Iceland, and that was because they'd let us in so we could go there and film. But there was a film about stars. And I must say, I was reluctant to make a film about stars again, because the, the, it's a heavily cliched area. A lot of people make films about stars. I've made films about stars. They're interesting. They create the chemical elements and all those things. But but it's all been said. So but it but it was felt that we should make a film about stars. And actually, during the filming, we were searching for some kind of interesting philosophical thread. You know, some kind of framing that's original. And um, my director, it was wonderful. He, he actually was an arts director primarily. Ashley Gething and he'd come from he he directed Shakespeare and things like that so so we we kind of started talking in, in a bar somewhere probably when we started filming that that these things are that they're, they're like god they're godlike in a very interesting way because they're that they are the creators of the of everything other than hydrogen and helium in our bodies as the stars created and they're also creators in the sense that they are the furnaces in the sky, that they provide the temperature difference, which is essential for complexity to emerge, so thermodynamics. But also, they're interesting because they're mortal, because they, they die. And we, we got interested in this idea that the gods are mortal gods, right? And so, sort of, I don't know, mythological element crept in. But that, that, that grew during filming because that's what we started talking about in the evening when we'd finished filming we started talking about these these mortal gods and this idea and so it kind of seeped into the film well i mentioned Feynman earlier and his um exploration of what uh the act of doing science can teach us and Feynman in a very famous essay in 1955 defines science as a satisfactory philosophy of ignorance which is an absolutely beautiful description and he said that the most important thing about science is that you become you have a very strong acquaintance he's I can't remember what words he used I think it was acquaintance an acquaintance with doubt because because you have an idea about how nature works and almost all the time it turns out you're not right that's what research science is like and so nature is an extremely harsh teacher. Uh, but it's the, it's, he says that the, the idea that doubt is not to be feared, but welcomed and discussed is actually the most important lesson 
that science or, or the act of doing science can deliver to wider society. It's the fact that you don't know everything. He even says, Feynman even says that it's a, you can extend that to democracy. Democracy is the idea that we don't know how to run a country because we change it every four years, right? So it's, but so therefore it's built in. So actually the, the idea that we keep changing direction in our societies, there's a pendulum. You can imagine swinging and it obviously in, in our political language, it swings to the left, it swings to the right. It goes labor and conservative, whatever it does. But the thing is, and sometimes we like it and sometimes we don't, but the very fact that the pendulum is swinging is a manifestation of and the guarantor of your freedom. Right? It tells you, as long as things go against you and for you and against you and for you, it tells you that you're in a free society. And the moment the pendulum stops, even if it's in your favor and you get the government that you want every single time, then your society is no longer free. So, so Feynman develops this wonderful exploration of, of what this basic act of trying to understand nature can teach us all. And it's about doubt. So therefore, if someone says, we don't even know if the universe had a beginning, right? We know that it was hot and dense 13.8 billion years ago, but we have very good evidence that it was around before it was hot and dense. And we don't understand the beginning of the universe at all. It's, it's, we don't understand the opposite end of time, which is inside black holes either, which is why we're interested in them. So, so therefore, it seems to me that it's a, a, an act of, hubris to just say well it, all I can say is I don't know how the universe began and, and at that point it seems to me once you've said I don't know you might as well put a full stop there and shut up <laughs> but you, so you know, I, I don't know but then I think this you know it's like someone asked me the other day about unidentified flying objects you know, this congressional panel on UFOs and I said, the thing is, it's, it's in the words, isn't it? It's just unidentified. So should we just shut up now? You can't go, it's unidentified. Therefore, I think there's an alien civilization close by that's building flying saucers that are trying to evade our defenses. And there's a big cover up and the CIA are not telling us everything. So no, unidentified. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, so JPL, if you don't know that, that place, it's where everything was built. So. And the Voyager spacecraft, Viking, if you know anything about space flight, everything was built there. And so I did, I wrote to them and um, they sent me from Oldham, you know, in the seventies. And they sent back this package filled with pictures of Jupiter and Saturn from California. And I couldn't believe it. And so I always remember that I can, you know, it's a Jet Propulsion Forestry. I think it's 9,800 Oak Grove Drive, Pasadena, California, CA91103. I remember the, even the postcode, the zip, zip code. And so, yeah, so so JPL, so we filmed there um, following the Perseverance rover, um, which as we speak is on Mars and it's taking samples in a river delta, an ancient dry river delta, because we the, the conditions, we talked about the hydrothermal vents there um, in that previous clip. If you think what the origin of life is, it has to be a transition between geochemistry and biochemistry. Because what else can it be? Because when the Earth formed, <laughs> it didn't have life on it. And then life appeared on yeah. it. So you have active geology, and that somehow yeah. needs to become biology. Um, so Mars had the same conditions as Earth 3.5 to 4 billion years ago. It had water, it had active geology, in the region where Perseverance is now. Uh, yeah, so, so Perseverance is digging down in the river delta and collecting samples and it's analysing them. And so we followed it for a week, which was wonderful because the planning meetings, Perseverance is a tremendously intelligent machine. It drives itself, broadly speaking. And just shows you how, how I, I, I love engineering and, and the the, the engineers say things that are just so obvious when they've said them. So if you think about where a rover on Mars, then um, it's got pictures around it. And so you can, you, can, you can look at the pictures that come down every morning and you can say, that's a good path. We can see a path there. But at some point it will get to a point because Mars is so far away and you can't control it all the time where it knows more than you do because it's got new pictures because it's moved. And at that point, they hand over 
the driving of the rover to the rover. So the rover then drives itself. So there's this gradual transition from the humans telling it where to go to the rover trying to get to where they want it to go. But 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 then the thing is, I've got to, it's it's called a sample return mission ultimately. So what is what what's happening is those samples are going to come back to Earth because you can't. It's very difficult to prove that there's life present or traces of life. It took us 20 or 30 years to agree that these things called stromatolites that we found in Australia had life there, and we've got them. <laughs> you know, we've got the. So 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 ultimately they're coming back, but the way they're going to get them back is. J JPL's motto is dare mighty things. So they're gonna, they've got them and, and the rover's gonna drop them uh, when it's taken them all, it's gonna leave them at an agreed place on Mars. And then a mission, another mission's gonna go and they're gonna land a little rover called the Fetch Rover, which is gonna go and get the little samples and it's gonna take them and put them in a little rocket, which will have also landed on Mars. But they're worried in an engineering sense about launching a rocket from the surface of Mars because they don't know what the consistency mm. of the ground is and so on. So they've realized, they've decided the safest way to do it is to catapult the rocket into the air and then light the engine because it's easier for them to test that on Earth. So they're going to catapult it into the air, light the engine. This thing's going to go into Martian orbit um, and it's about the size of a beach ball, which will have all the samples in it, completely passive. So no power, no radio, nothing. And so they're going to leave that in the orb. And another mission's going to come and it's going to find it optically, which is engineering speak, to look for it in, in Martian orbit. And then it's going to ingest that into another spacecraft. Another little robot's going to go and get the samples out and clean them for planetary protection reasons, put them into another rocket, which will then fire its engines, come back to Earth ballistically, re enter the Earth's atmosphere with no parachutes or rockets and hit the ground in Utah. And then they're gonna find them and they take them to a lab. I think that the questions raised by cosmology and fundamental physics are universal questions. They're, they're questions that transcend all of science because they're questions about origins, origin of the universe, the nature of reality, the place of life in the universe, how important or otherwise is life in the, in the cosmos. Um, and, and so I, I think, so the, the key thing for me is I like to delve deeply into these ideas. So there are elements of the show where I actually write equations down. I, I realized that I was going to have a blackboard actually. And I realized that was not very good because no one can see it really. So, so I start, I got an iPad. So, so I, I, there's some, I really do delve into the um, Stephen Hawking's work on black holes. But at the same time, then, after a few minutes, I, I come out and try to talk about the, the meaning of those discoveries. What does it mean that, that, you know, we have discovered that we, there are 400 billion suns in the Milky Way and we orbit around one of them. What does that mean? That, that's a challenging idea. Right? It might mean that we're tiny and fragile and, and, and insignificant. I don't think it does because around none of those stars possible that none of them as we've talked about life may exist around very few of them um so so it's it's uh, and so meaning the meaning of our discoveries is a conversation that requires much more than just science it's i mean in, in the shows that we have i have a uh, music i have marla's 10th plays at some point because I, I think marla if you want to know what it means to live a fragile finite life in an infinite eternal universe then marla's actually thought about that <laughs> He, he did a quite a good job at answering it, actually. Sevelius is in there, yeah. Again, he, he did a, a very good job at, 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 at reacting to the beauty and mystery of nature. And so, so I think the show tries to... The reason it's for everybody, and I think ultimately the reason why I've been fortunate enough to be able to do it in front of big audiences is because not everybody's interested in the scientific detail, but a lot of people are but a lot of people are also interested in what what are we to make of these these yeah. discoveries they're frightening right it is cosmology is intellectually challenging it, no doubt one of my favorite um books i don't know if you know it but richard holmes wrote a book called the age of wonder and richard holmes is it was a biographer of romantic poets but he wrote this wonderful book about that period in time 
1700s, early 1800s, from which Frankenstein emerged, Mary Shelley. But when Faraday was lecturing at the Royal Institution down the road, and Banks was going to Australia, and, and these great pioneers, Humphrey Davy, and then that period of science, which he calls the Romantic Era, uh, which coincided with Romantic poetry, probably not coincidentally. Um, I am of that mindset. I, I feel I have a lot more in common with someone like Humphrey Davy in the way that he looked at the science and the possibilities of science and the beauty of science than I do with some of the rather more postmodern views mm -hmm. of science, which is understandable. You know, I mean, if you look at the 20th century, you can point the finger at the, the capabilities that science delivered and, and have a rather grimmer view of what technological progress does. If you've been through the First World War and the Second World War and seen the atom bomb develops, then your romantic image of science is challenged and there have been many books written on that. But, but I think that ultimately that those people, those Faraday and Davy, those people were right, actually. It, it is the way that we will um, not only secure our future, but have a better future. It's, it's learning about nature. I think, I mean, the challenges are different now, as you said, we, we do live in this rather fractured age. What, what's interesting is that I think we've been through it before, perhaps in a different guise. And I mentioned Oppenheimer and Feynman earlier. They're, they're Oppenheimer, just after he delivered the Reith lectures, uh, months after, which were called Science and the Common Understanding, where he was trying to, you know, as I said, talk about the transferable skills that, that, that interrogating nature could be could deliver to our wider society. So this this beautiful series of lectures. Months later, McCarthy was after him, and he so he experienced this, this vicious political attack. And, and, and was turned from hero, really. Manhattan Project, you know, that was a, certainly in America at the time, was seen as a heroic effort, and it put an end to the war. We can debate, you know, it was, we can debate whether it was heroic or not. So, but he pushed it through, the atom bomb was developed. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and then, not long later, less than a decade later, he's been essentially chased out of public life by McCarthy. So, so this, this polarisation that we see now is not new. And the response is probably the same. No, I mean, because I'm, I'm not a BBC employee. So, so um, I, you know, I make programmes on a, on a one-off basis yeah. for the BBC. So, um, and, and honestly, so I, I think it's very different for someone like yourself. I suppose a news presenter, if you're presenting a Today programme and things like that, then clearly that there can be a a view that, that bias should not creep into your presenting. I suppose that's an obvious thing to say, isn't it? Right, so if you think about that process, you go back three years, they had um, experts, and they had very, very eloquent experts, who, who I really have tremendous respect for, because it was extremely difficult. I mean, I said I, I was interviewed on today, I think, about about it in what, some context or other. And I said, I mean, it. They were, those experts were, what, what they were, they were showing people a window onto science in real time, right? So if you think about that process, you go back three years and we, this virus either didn't exist or we didn't know it was there, right? It was in an animal population or whatever it was. So we didn't know it was in humans. And then it comes into humans, we don't know what it is. We don't even know if it's airborne or if it's in droplets or whatever. And, and so the advice changes as knowledge is acquired. And I said, you know, science is, is our best way of acquiring reliable knowledge about the world. Yet you do some more research, you find out some new knowledge. And what those people were challenged with was giving very high stakes public health advice in a rapidly changing situation where our knowledge was improving all the time. So it was perfectly possible. This is, this is why science education and, and popularization of science is important actually. Because it's obvious if you do science that one day the advice may be, um, we think it's very, it's mainly surfaces. So don't touch surfaces and, and, and make sure your hands are clean and stuff. And then, and then five days later, it might be actually, now we think it's more airborne is probably the problem, yeah. so put a mask on. 
that 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 shows an evolution of knowledge, right? But then communicating that, it's very difficult because people will say, "Well, you told me last week to do something else," and you go, "Yeah, because we found some other shit out. <laughs> you know, we, we we learned something, right?" But th that's how science works. Um, as I said before, it's it's a satisfactory philosophy of ignorance. It's learning about something. But when you when you when you put it into an extremely serious public health framework, where the stakes are incredibly high, then it's very very difficult to communicate that. And, and I think the scientists did a tremendous job. The web. I mean, I should say it's, it it will acquire lots of data. Um, it's, it's got many missions and they're all interesting. One of them is to observe the formation of the first stars and galaxies, which is a tremendous problem. We don't really know how the first stars and galaxies formed. We don't really know how those enormous black holes, the, the one in, there's a galaxy called M87, about 55 million light years away, which has got a black hole six billion times the mass of the sun in it. Six billion times the mass of the sun. How did that get there, right? We don't really know. So, so the, 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 one of the things the web can do is it can, because of its sensitivity to longer wavelengths, it can see light that's traveled across the universe for longer, uh, and therefore it can see further back in time. So, so that's one of the things it can do. The other, one of the other interesting things, beautiful things it can do is it can look at the atmospheres of exoplanets. Um, so we want to know whether a lot of, we've discovered over 4,000 planets around different stars. And we like to know what the atmospheres are made of. Because, for example, on the speculative end, what if you discover a, bit, a lot of oxygen, 20% oxygen, let's say, in an atmosphere? That's photosynthesis. So, so kind of paradoxically, maybe, we might discover life on another world beyond our solar system before we discover life on Mars, if it should it exist. The technological progress that's been made is clearly, it's private sector technological progress. There's no, that SpaceX have been astonished at doing something that many people thought was virtually impossible, which is building a reusable rocket. And I don't think that would have been done. Well, it wasn't done by NASA or by Roscosmos or anyone. So, um, so and, and I suppose it mirrors the development of commercial aviation in that respect, that you would not have had things like the 787 or the Airbus A380 if governments had been building them. You know, it's a private sector that ultimately makes some cheap. I think SpaceX, it, it's still, I mean, it's true that it was very smart. Congress passed a bill that allowed NASA to do much more subcontracting out, mm. which is what funded SpaceX and Blue Origin, actually. So it's still, in some sense, public money. But, so I think that level of, of in private sector innovation is extremely important because that's making space accessible and it's far cheaper now. I mean, I think someone told me that I think SpaceX are charging it. They're making a massive profit now. It's pretty cheap to do what they're doing, which is astonishing, um, given what they do. So, so that's important. But I, the sen there's another sense to your question, which I think is right, which is you've got to get the regulation right. I mean, it, having private engin engineering companies building these things is one thing, but there's a whole legal framework you have to operate around, for example, mining asteroids. But yeah, so so, and actually, I was involved um, in a, a thing called Asteroid Day, which is a uh, it's in Luxembourg every year. And the reason it's in Luxembourg is because Luxembourg is one of the cent legal centres for space exploration. And there's a lot of discussion there about the framework around mining, for example. So who owns what? If you land on an asteroid, then does, does SpaceX own the asteroid? Yeah, so, so there's two things. One is it's been extremely positive in developing reusable rockets that can give us a cheap and reliable access to near-Earth orbit and beyond, which is very important. Because it, the other thing to say is that this is not a luxury. I mean, we, we rely, space is already industrialized, you know, with satellite navigation or weather forecasting or climate science, all that comes from satellites. So, so it's a good thing that these companies are operating. But I do take the point that you don't want a monopoly. And so, so there is a great public interest in making sure the legal framework and, the, and there are not just, there's not just one company that can have access yeah. to space. I think there's some optimism there. I mean, if you, look at, if you look at climate science, for example, I don't know what you think, maybe you have a view on this, but I think 
politically that that sort of debate around whether climate change is happening at all seems to have faded. I, I think there's a drift towards more a universal acceptance there is a problem there, if not policy solutions. Also, the problem that is simply stated, I think, that these things are global problems. And my, this is one of the reasons I think world leaders should be sent into space because and brought back because because when it's clear that this is one extremely fragile and valuable planet and the civilization on it that's us it is is almost inconceivably valuable i think because i i i think it's a reasonable guess given that we don't know that there's only one civilization at the moment in the milky way galaxy i think that's a fair it's a reasonable guess biologists that i speak to tend to think that possibly the case actually and um, and therefore the 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 idea that we should be working together as a species on this planet is just so self-evidently obvious especially when faced with a global challenge like climate change or pandemics it's obvious right and it's also obvious how difficult it is to do that because you know when we build international institutions then you know, as we've seen, that that tends to cause friction in certain quarters. The the, the origin itself, we don't even know whether it had an origin. Uh, we don't we don't know what the beginning of time actually means because we don't know what time is. Um, we're beginning to suspect, from the study of black holes in particular, that that it emerges from quantum entanglement. But we I won't talk about that because I've got much time. <laughs> So, so the point is, we don't know what it means, the, the origin, whether it had a, a, an origin in time or not. In terms of the Big Bang, we very strongly suspect that that was an event in a pre-existing universe. So we think that space and time existed before that, and the universe was probably cold and expanding very fast. And that expansion slowed down, and the, the slowing down of the expansion is what we call the Big Bang. So that's called inflation. So that's the best, the best theory of what happened before the Big Bang. But um, what, what started inflation off, we don't have the knowledge, so we just don't know. I mean, the age of the universe, uh, is, is the measurement, not the, the age of the universe hasn't changed, but the, the, the measurement has changed a lot. It was 15 billion for a while, and then it was, um, and so that's just based on better measurements and a better understanding. But the number you mentioned, the number of stars in the Milky Way, that was uh, only a few years ago, we used to say 200 billion. And now we're saying 400 billion. It, but that's coming from new measurements. Is that there's a, there's a, a mission called Gaia, which is mapping the Milky Way, which is an astonishing mission. And, and so we're getting a better, a better map of the Milky Way and understanding its origin and evolution better. So, um, but yeah, I think it, the, the great discoveries, I mean, the Higgs particle is a big discovery as well. Because my most cited paper, so um, which is the, the one that's you know, had the biggest impact, right, um, was a paper I wrote years ago about physics without a Higgs boson at the Large Hadron Collider. And of course, I was wrong, there is a Higgs boson. But we developed some techniques in it that are widely used, which is so, so you know, in terms of a big discovery, the Higgs was a big discovery. This goes back to the media and television. I remember at CERN, I was there when it was we announced the discovery, and they were saying to Peter, Peter's not the most demonstrative of physicists. And, and someone said to him in the end, how do you feel though? How do you feel, Peter, about this? And he said, oh, it's very nice to be right sometimes. If, if a big UFO came now, we walk outside and over Westminster, there's a spaceship hovering. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised. I mean, there are deep questions, you know, are we alone in the universe? I mean, probably not, you'd guess. There are two, two trillion galaxies in the observable universe, right? So it, you would expect not. It's a theory that, isn't it? I mean, it's the, it, so there's a theory there. And so you can get the little things and we will analyze them and have a look. I mean, I wouldn't, I, I, it's funny because on, you mentioned social media, I think I, you know, occasionally on social media, I'll, I'll quite often <laughs> I'll tweet something <laughs> and and there'll be quite a few people who disagree really reasonably strongly with what I said and one of them is is the the UFO thing you know that 
I mean, there are people who really believe that there are UFOs visiting the Earth. And I always say that, it's, you know, I haven't seen any evidence of that that I think is strong evidence. Yeah. It's a huge claim that there are other civilizations out there that are visiting us. But I wouldn't be surprised, in a, in a, in a sense, in a strict sense, that if I said to someone the other day, you know, if, if a big UFO came now, we walk outside and over Westminster, there's a spaceship hovering. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised because I know that there are trillions of planets in the Milky Way galaxy alone and hundreds of billions of stars. And there's been a lot of time. And one of the great mysteries actually in physics is why we don't seem to see much out there, anything. We haven't, you know, there's strong, there's strong evidence of nothing out there at all at the moment. We have, we have no strong evidence of any life beyond Earth. And that's a puzzle and a paradox. So it's a, it's about, with, with those claims, you don't rule them out. If someone says, well, I've got this, I found this thing at the bottom of the sea and I think it's really weird, um, then the correct thing to do is go, okay, we'll put it in a lab and get an electron microscope and prod it around and find out just how weird it is. And nature, Feynman again said, the thing to remember is nature does not care at all what you think. Nature just doesn't, it doesn't matter who you are or how famous you are, any letters you've got before or after your name, whatever, it doesn't matter. Nature just is. So if indeed a, an alien spacecraft crashed into wherever it was that they found these things a billion years ago and left all the fragments there and we've dug them up, then that's interesting. But, it, but if it didn't, then that's also interesting because then we get a profound puzzle about why, why there don't seem to be many civilizations around. If we don't find a way of not compromising, but understanding that the world is very complicated, so then it's not only a single country, it's all the different countries with different cultures and different political histories and different views. If we don't find a way of um, sort of stopping arguing and trying to find a way to make that work. I've just given everyone the means to destroy themselves. So I personally have delivered the atom bomb, which is now has kind of raised the stakes on these arguments. You know, this is the 50s. There are threats from all over the place. I still think the threat is probably human stupidity. The possibility that someone will just press the button still you know, we grew up with that. So it's, it's interesting, actually, if you grew up in the 70s and 80s, you grew up with the, the, the world's going to get destroyed by nuclear like bombs. It, they're all there. They're still there. And you still have the same kinds of problems and it, obviously international tensions. And they're, they're, so, so I think, you know, for all the existential threats we talk about and we've talked about I remember just as an aside I remember my radio show The Infinite Monkey Cage just before the pandemic we did a show on pandemics and one of the experts uh, said right at the end he said I tell you it's the, it's the bats are going to get us it's the bats <laughs> and there's something going to come out of bats I bet, I bet you that's what it is and you know I mean even that is controversial there's all sorts of theories about what happened with that virus but ultimately his point was that that pandemics are really a big threat. Yeah. And of course, we basically ignored it. And thought, that's funny, isn't it? Yeah, pandemic. You know, and then about three months later, there's a pandemic. But, but of all those threats, I still think that the, the most, the big problem at the moment is how to get along as a global society in a world where we have the means to destroy ourselves. So it's not just a, a fight in a pub. It's exchanging nuclear weapons if we're not careful. We, we, we seem to have avoided the... We, we obviously, we've avoided destroying ourselves so far. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, I'm, wor I'm worried about it because I'm worried that um, it seems to me that our, I don't know, political debate has become extremely polarised in a way that really matters, particularly in the United States, actually, yeah. um, where it, it's very important that that country stays stable. So I'm worried about that. And I, and, and you see it here to an extent. And so, although actually I, you know, we seem to be handling it quite well in this country. I mean, we don't usually give credit to our political system, but it seems to be dealing with a, quite an upheaval, particularly starting with 
with with the Brexit referendum and those things, it seems to be dealing with it. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I'm worried. Um, and one of the reasons I'm worried, actually, I, I was asked, I was asked to give a talk at the the COP climate summit in Glasgow just by video, one minute, and they just it was a little project, and they said if if, if you could say anything to the world leaders there, what would you say? And I said just very simply that given what I know and given to a lot of people I've spoken to, it's possible that we're the only civilization in the Milky Way galaxy at the moment. Right? It's, it's worth considering that might be the case. And there are reasons we can go into about why that may be the case, but it's possible. So if it's true, imagine it's true, I think that if we're talking about the meaning, meaning of it all, what does it mean to, to be a human in this universe? Well, meaning is a property of intelligence, I think. So clearly the universe means something to us. So meaning exists here. But if there's no other intelligence out there in our galaxy and we destroy ourselves, then we might eliminate meaning in a galaxy of 400 billion stars forever. That's what we might do. So consider that, <laughs> world leaders. That's... That you, you have potentially a galactic size responsibility to maintain meaning in a galaxy. And it, so that's, I, that's why it bothers me, because I think that's true. So I think, I think what we do here will have ramifications in that sense, way beyond the, the shores of our own planet. Because, you know, you look at, to me, a lifeless world, a lifeless galaxy, is a meaningless galaxy. I've been lucky to meet a lot of astronauts, Apollo astronauts as well, who tended to be test pilots. You know, so they tended to be, uh, and those, those guys from the 60s and 70s, and they tended to be guys at the time, the Apollo P astronauts, were really um, focused on flying those things as aircraft. But yet, all of them, Every single one that I've been lucky enough to meet said the same thing. Which is the moment you're off the Earth and look at it against the blackness of space, you start to get a feeling that there's something really important here, mm. way beyond everything else. So I think that's powerful. That's why I think I did say once that um, I thought it was when it, I don't know which prime minister. I think it was Boris, it was Boris Johnson. I, I said I said I think he should be sent into space, and I actually meant. I didn't mean, I meant he should yeah, put, come bring him to. back as well. But I think I, he w I would, as a taxpayer, I would, I would pay. I would gladly, a bit of my taxes went to, as soon as you became prime minister, you went up on one of those, even it, it, the little suborbital hop, go up and have a look. And I think it would be a very good use of money and then come back. And it'd be, you know, you could get a ticket for, it could be a million dollars. It'd be a brilliant use of a, a million quid be fantastic because they come back with that in their mind <laughs>